So I've gotten a lot of requests to talk about Marcel Duchamp and the Dadaists, who were part of the Dada movement. Um, and to do that, I thought I would read to you a little bit from one of the Dada manifestos, which is where um, some of the artists really put forth what their ideas as an artistic movement were. Dada knows everything. Dada spits on everything. Dada says no thing. Dada has no fixed ideas. Dada does not catch flies. Dada is bitterness laughing at everything that has ever been accomplished, sanctified. Dada is never right. No more painters, no more writers, no more religions, no more royalists, no more anarchists, no more socialists, no more police, no more airplanes, no more urinary passages. Like everything in life, Dada is useless. Everything happens in a completely idiotic way. We are incapable of treating seriously any subject whatsoever, let alone this subject, ourselves. And so more than a movement of something that is, Dada is really a movement that tries to show what it is not. And in so doing, the Dadaists are really holding up a mirror to the art world at large and trying to point out issues and hypocrisies um, and really stupidities that they see in the broader art world. And so, um, you know, it's really quite an oppositional force in the history of art, but opposition that they claim is destructive, but I would argue is actually um, quite creative and allows us to build up a new understanding of the way that art and culture function in the world. Marcel Duchamp was born in France and uh, lived and was very active in New York and the United States. Um, was really at the forefront of the Dada movement and beca became really famous in part because of this series of works he did called Ready Maids. And Ready Maids are um, exactly what they sound like. They're works of art that are already made. So he would go to stores uh, and flea markets and things and buy things that he felt were aesthetically neutral. So things that had no positive or negative aesthetic connotation to them. And he would take them back to his studio and put them on a shelf in a corner, uh, just somewhere there, and see how it felt to live with those objects for an extended period of time. And if he felt like they started to gain some sort of aesthetic resonance, if they became visually interesting to him in really any way, positive or negative, he did away with them. He was aiming to find things that had neutral or really no aesthetic value to them. And so one of the most famous examples of these ready-made sculptures is the one that we're looking at here called Fountain. And Fountain um, is exactly what it looks like. It's a urinal that uh, was bought at either a hardware store or, um, you know, wherever one gets urinals. Um, it's not something Duchamp sculpted himself. It's not a replica of a urinal. It's actually a urinal. It's a toilet. Um, it's put on its back. It's inverted. And then Duchamp signs it with the signature R. Mutt and dates it 1917. And that's the work. And so, you know, going back to one of our perennial criticisms that I heard certainly as a tour guide, um, in a museum of modern art, where is the skill here? And, you know, I think when we think about art, one way that I like to consider and sort of understand the history of art and why certain artistic objects are held in favor and others are not, um, there are of course many factors, but I think one way we can understand it is by dividing art and artists into two sort of general groups. We have artists who are contributing to a history of thought in art and challenging assumptions about what is art, what is culture, why are things created. And then we have technicians of art, so people who are really pushing the practice of painting and sculpture um, and the decorative arts forward in new and um, dynamic ways. So we have sort of thinkers and practitioners um, and most artists are some sort of combination of both. Um, and Duchamp certainly has um, practitioner uh, skill. He is a skilled artist. He does have paintings. He's quite um, an influential artist in a really technical way. But I think his most important contributions to art, certainly when we consider the ready-mades, are in the realm of the intellectual history of art.
So what is the major intellectual contribution of Marcel Duchamp through the ready-mades? Um, when we think about the beginning of the 20th century in the United States, it's really the rise of modernism in the United States. We have the rise of museum culture, the value of modern art starts to rise, um, and there's a really wide-ranging intellectual and capital world forming around modern art and uh, the art market generally. And so Duchamp, along with the rest of the Dadaists, is in a way holding up a mirror to that art world um, and uh, the world more generally and challenging our assumptions and making us question why these things have become so valuable and so important. So by taking this toilet and sticking it in a museum, He's now forcing us to consider why something like this would be considered of value. What is it doing in this space? And by doing that, he's really asking us to think about what is the museum space in general? Why are some things relegated to be here and other things not? If this sculpture is sitting next to a Picasso painting and you're looking back and forth between the two, you suddenly have to consider what the difference is between them and why something may be considered high value modern art and the other is really simply just a toilet. And then by doing that and forcing us to go into an elevated space of a museum, a space that's really apart from the rest of the world, he's sort of turning the museum experience on its head. So you're going into this space that purports to be one of heightened class and culture, and then you're standing and you're staring at a toilet. Um, and so he's also trying to point out issues um, and hypocrisies in many ways in the museum space and show us the way that the museum space as a gallery is constructed. Um, and this is something that my sister, Melissa, who works at Artnet, has researched and written about extensively. Um, and I think it's something that we often forget is that artworks, that when they're put into a museum, take on new meaning and new context and are authorized and raised up literally on a pedestal by virtue of where they are placed in the world and in the museum. And so when you step into the museum and you're now considering all of these different questions, what level of skill is required to enter in here? Who's making these decisions about what is displayed and where? Um, what is considered something of quality and what is not? What thoughts are being evoked by the different works of art here? Um, it begins to peel back the curtain a little bit on the process behind the construction of an art world, an art market, culture in general. I was actually teaching this sculpture to a student of mine, um, and he said, yeah, Duchamp is just sort of taking the piss. Um, which is very funny considering it's a urinal, but also is, I think, a really um, useful way of understanding what's going on here. Duchamp wants us to uh, sort of recognize, in many ways, the absurdities of um, sort of this classed museum culture and the capital associations that come around with it. Um, and so, you know, there's really two ways uh, that Duchamp is able to do this. One is just by virtue of the context and placement of this object in um, the gallery space. And the other is, I think, a little bit more subtle, but it's through the signature that's placed on the bottom here. Um, so signatures are actually really interesting and something I think we, we often take for granted. But when we think about... Um, what a signature is. It's a way of showing an individual's approval or authority over something. So, you know, when we have a signed work of art, we know it was made by the artist's hand um, and we can confer additional value on it because of that. It's the same thing if you ever get a baseball card autographed, um, you know that it has been handled by the person who it claims to represent, and they're endorsing that representation. Um, if you get a book signed, you're going to a store, you've met the author, you've interacted with them, and it confers a new level of authority to the text we're looking at. Um, you know, even a check, if you sign, a, a check is only valid if you sign it and endorse it, showing that you approve of this purchase, that it's really you who's making out this check. Um, 
and receiving and giving these funds. Um, so signatures are our way of stamping individual approval on things. And um, the notion of signing art isn't something that really um, is consistent through time and history. And it's certainly not consistent throughout literary time and history. If we think about biblical texts, texts in antiquity, ancient myths, these are all things that we ascribe to individual authors but aren't necessarily written by individual hands. Um, and individual people, but we ascribe them to, we ascribe these texts to individual authors to give them a sense of authority and give them a sense of weight in the world. And that's exactly what's happening here. So if Duchamp went into this store and there's 10 urinals on a shelf and he picks out one, the other nine go into bathrooms and we never really think about again. But one of them gets signed and dated and so has the authority of this influential artist associated with it and through that signature is then granted value both um, in terms of capital and also ter in terms of cultural value. Um, and it is completely transformed just by this one artist lending his name to this ready-made found object. But even in this sort of commentary on authority and authorization, Duchamp is again sort of undermining what we are initially thinking and his own critique because he doesn't sign it with his own name. He signs the work R. Mutt. And um, there's a lot of really interesting scholarship on R. Mutt as an alternative persona um, and all the interesting ways that that plays into Duchamp's personal history and um, artistic history. Um, but we won't get into that right now. But I think one of the important things is that the only value that this sculpture has as a work of art is its association with Marcel Duchamp, who doesn't even put his real name on the sculpture. He authorizes it in a way that doesn't actually grant it the authority of his name. And so in that way, he's again playing with us with this sense that um, individual authority, that uh, the word and approval of one person is so significant um, because his approval, at this point he is a very influential artist, um, does mean a lot. But he is not granting that approval to his own works. And even through withholding that approval, he is in a way approving of them. And so the last thing I want to share with you is um, a little story that I used to tell on my tours at the Yale University Art Gallery where they have another Duchamp ready-made, which is just a shovel. Um, and it's called In Advance of the Broken Arm. And um, the shovel that is on display is um, signed and dated, but it's dated twice. And so it's dated with the original date, and then it says replica, and then it has another date on it. And so what happened, the, the legend goes, that the original shovel was lost. And so um, either a curator or a director of the museum went and visited Marcel Duchamp, who sent the curator out to go buy another shovel. And he brought the shovel back to Duchamp. Duchamp signed it, and he got on the Metro North from New York back to New Haven, and that is the shovel that's hanging up. So Duchamp is again showing us that the object is totally immaterial. If the shovel is lost, he can sign a new shovel and put it back up, and it's just as good as the one that was there before. What's interesting and important and compelling about the ready-made works is not the objects themselves, but the questions that they force us to ask and the mirror that they hold up to the art world and the cultural society more generally.